on the official Celtic FC podcast. Scottish MMA legend Stevie Ray reflects on his incredible career, shares stories of his toughest battles and looks ahead to his much-anticipated return to the cage. I mean, really, since 2015, this has been my full-time job. Uh, so it's hard to, like, walk away. Hello and welcome to the official Celtic FC podcast. I'm Matthew Campbell and I'm delighted to say that joining me in the studio today is legendary Scottish MMA fighter Stevie Ray. Uh, now, Stevie spent years fighting on the UFC card before moving to the Professional Fighters League, or PFL for short. He announced his retirement from the fight game last year, but on September 28th, he is set to make his... Uh, much anticipated comeback fighting Lewis Long as the main event at the Glasgow Hydro. As well as his record of 38 MMA fights and 25 wins, Stevie's also a Celtic supporter. And Stevie, it's brilliant to have you with us here in the studio today. Ah, it's good to be here, man. It's, good uh, view. It's incredible, isn't it? Ah, I'll have cool, a little man. look around about the place. It's just such an incredible big arena, um, which is something that you're, of course, no stranger to, having been in the fight game for so long and been at the top of the sport. We're going to get a wee chat about that, about that uh, that wonderful career that you've that you've had as a mixed martial artist. But before we come into the sort of, I guess I guess the sort of stardom, the you know the high points of your career, take me right back to the start because you're from Kirkcaldy and uh, Kirkcaldy and Fife, obviously. Yeah. But how did you get involved in in mixed martial arts? Eh, uh, so I was. When I was kind of, well, when I was younger, I got bullied a bit, kind of growing up through school and stuff, um, from like probably the age of 10 and, and above. Uh, so I was always in fights, uh, kind of fights in the street. And then when I started uh, started getting to like 16 and above, uh started getting into a bit of trouble with getting into fights as well. Um, you know, just fighting in the street and then ended up uh, getting lifted, uh, put in the cells and stuff for it. And then uh, I actually, I I was in a a fight. Um, I ended up getting remanded in prison. Uh, I spent a week in prison, uh, Perth, just for fighting. Uh, but uh, yeah, ended up. Um, I was on a curfew, I ended up getting put on a tag for, for then fighting again while I was on a curfew. I was just fighting all the time. Yeah. And when I was 19, um, I started MMA. One of my friends, uh, Dean Crichton, he had been training and, uh, you know, back then called it cage fighting. Mm. But, uh, yeah, I bumped into him and he said... Uh, he had been doing cage fighting training, and uh, I should come along. You know, you know, you knew that I was always getting into fights in the street, and I had a wee bit of a reputation maybe for being kind of tough and mm -hmm. getting into fights. So uh, I he asked me to come along, and literally just uh, I think it was actually the second time because the first time I was like, ah, I'll maybe come doing. I never yeah. never ended up getting into it. But uh, the second time that I seen him, I was like, you know what, I'm not doing nothing. Uh, I'll come, I'm come down. Uh, started training, and my first training session, um, I was in the guy's back garden. Right. Uh, he had like a log cabin in his back garden, probably fitted like maybe ten people. So it was like a private club. Mm -hmm. I remember we went down, and uh, the coach was actually annoyed that. Dean had brought me down without asking. Right, he was okay. he was like, Oh, we've not got any space in that now. He's like, uh, look, you could watch today and if you like it you can come back. Uh but the class or kind of private class that was happening, it was a bit quiet. So he was like, You know what, you can you can join in. Yeah. And it was uh, it was right at the deep end sparring. Um and I that's it. I loved it. Uh, so I'm interested about it because as well you're saying, I mean, what age you're saying about nineteen year old there? Nineteen, I was. I. So I mean, uh, you better place to tell us than anybody, but I would think that seems like quite, quite old. You know, like Aye, in terms quite of late. Like boys yep. usually maybe get involved in this sport at maybe the early point of their teenage <laughs> years, but you were you were quite late into it. Aye, uh, I mean, I when you hear like anybody making it in sport. Uh, you know, you hear that they've been doing it since they've been like three or four years old, or you know, a lot younger. But uh, 
I I started quite late. I mean, I started. I had never done any martial arts before the age of nineteen. Apart from maybe I'd went to a few boxing classes, mm -hmm. uh, like maybe at age sixteen or something. But no, I knew how to. I knew my stance. I'm yeah. left-handed, so I knew I was a southpaw. I knew how to punch a bit. And uh, and like I said, I was getting into fighting for all the wrong reasons and getting in trouble for it. Uh, so I was kind of, I had like a tough mentality and I thought that, I thought I could fight. Like, you know, I thought I was tough until I started learning how to actually fight. And I realised uh, how much just, you know, how uh, no that good I was yeah, at fighting yeah. compared to the people that actually knew how to fight. And I remember it just being like, so shocked at how someone half my weight right. could uh, could like choke me and put me in submissions and kind of throw me around if you like because at, at that time I'd been do doing a bit of like weightlifting, right. getting a bit bigger, uh, and I just I, I was hooked as soon as I started uh -huh. kind of. So at, at what at what point then do you start to think I'm going to take this amateur? I'm going to you know treat this as a competitive sport and not just a outlet. A training outlet, you know, when do you make that decision? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, like when I first started training, I just was doing it out of the pure enjoyment. Of it. Um, like I said, I, I started, I was on a, a tag, so I was I had a tag on my on my ankle for, for getting into fights and stuff. Um, so the training was half five till half six. Uh, I had to be home by seven o'clock. Um, and this was down near Dyser, uh, Ravens Craig kind of park area. Um, I didn't drive at the time, um, so I had to run home. Mm. Uh, so that was part of the, the fitness routine as well. I'd do my training and then I'd have to run home. I'd always get home like a minute before seven o'clock. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I just, to start with, I started training, enjoyed it, loved how, you, I liked, really enjoyed the, the Brazilian jiu-jitsu part, the, mm. the chokes, the submissions, the holds. And uh yeah, I thought once I got a bit better, I was like, you know what, I wouldn't mind competing. Uh, so after five months of training, I had my first MMA fight um, and I just started like booking the fights up mm -hmm. uh, quite quick. I mean, my first year of competing, I had seven amateur fights or semi-pro, it was called at the time, but it was amateur. And then I had five pro fights, so 12 fights all in the one year, which is like ridiculous. Yes. Uh, but, yeah, how do you, how I mean, do you, is that, you, you, that's 12 fights in a year, you know, it's, it's an awful busy schedule. Is that a mentality thing, though, that you're able just to recover and get on with the next one? You know, how do you get into that mindset? Uh, I I mean, uh, I was quite fortunate that I was I was finishing the fights quite quick, so mm. I was just going in 100 mile an hour, <laughs> uh, finishing the fight, uh, mostly by submission. So I was, like, getting submission wins. Um, no taking any damage. Uh, so like I fought on the Saturday, uh, then fought the following Sunday, eight days later. Mm. Uh, then maybe two weeks later, then I'd maybe have like a month break. Uh, but yeah, it's quite uh, cool looking back at how busy I was, and because I won all the fights as well, apart for the last one, I right. I lost a kind of robbery decision. Right. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it just kept me. Uh, focused mm -hmm. uh, on the straight and narrow as well because I enjoyed the for whatever reason I mean I don't know why I liked fighting yeah. you know uh, but I got like a, an enjoyment out of it um, it was keeping me out of trouble and aye and giving you a kind of purpose a bit of guidance yeah, in it. life but what you know you're talking about that turning professional which what were your feelings at that point you know was it just a natural progression you thought I'm ready for this or were you thinking career wise? Uh, it was more uh, so. Uh, I had booked out seven fights, uh, amateur fights, and I'd won them all. I went seven and oh, and I was like, you know what, maybe go pro. Um, went pro, uh, had another uh, four fights, uh, went four and oh pro. So, I mean, looking at it now, I don't, have, I don't think I was. Or it's maybe just because like it moves on, like times change. Like when when I was a pro, then there's amateurs better today right. than I was at a pro. So, because uh, the sports evolved I so much, say, like back nice. then you can get away with being good in one area, right. like being really good on the ground, uh, take everybody down and submit them. But now 
it's just evolved that much. You have to be good everywhere. So, do you, I mean, do you, I, do you notice that when you're in like the gym training, or even you're just watching the sport? Are you seeing the qualities improved markedly? Well, I I don't only see it; I feel it as well because <laughs> uh, some of the guys that I used to train with, you know, I do what I want with them, right. beat them up, and like in a obviously nice way. I'm not trying to hurt them, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm now the the one taking the <laughs> with them a bit. Um, yeah, there's just, I mean, when I first started training. Um, I joined the team I'm with a now higher level MMA. I joined them after a few years of training at another club, but I think I joined them 2013. Right. So I've been with them 11 years, and there's there's not really anybody still training that when I first started. You know, there's all these different yeah. uh, kind of criteria people that come through, and uh, and yeah, like I said, they're they're just evolving so much. So. Yeah, um, but it must aye. be exciting for you as well. You've been involved in this sport. You've seen that evolution. But let, let let's sort of skip on a few years after you know you've you've turned pro. Because I was reading, you know, it was 2015 that you fight in the UFC card for the first time. So even for people who are maybe you not know, <coughs> fully aware or fully invested in MMA, you know, people have heard of of the UFC. It's 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 one of the biggest sort of cards in the in the sport. Obviously, you win your 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 first fight um, under the UFC banner. Just tell me about that though. Tell me about you know making that step up, reaching the sort of the the high point in the sport, if you like, and then obviously being successful as well. Yeah, I mean, so the thing with MMA is it's so hard to try and make a living out of it. Um, I mean. Especially back then, there was like the UFC where you could make some money, and I, and that was like maybe the only place you could make money. I was Cage Warriors world champion before that, and I'm maybe getting paid like a thousand pound mm. for for defending my world title, which is obviously like pocket money. Mm -hmm. You can't live off that. I had a, so just before the UFC, I had two kids. Um, I had a third one on the way. Um. And the uh, Cage Warriors actually went like down the pan. They were, they kind of stopped being a promotion. I had just moved back home because I initially moved to Heart Hill so I could be close to to training. Um, but um, yeah, so I'd moved back home to Kirkcaldy, got a full time job, and it was almost looking like I was, you know, gonna give up and just mm. start providing, get a normal job. I was working as a fitness instructor. But and then the UFC call came. Uh, what was uh, two weeks notice? I had. It was the day after my my birthday. Um, my birthday is the twenty fifth of March. So I got the call on the twenty sixth of March. Could you um fight Marcin Bandel in two weeks' time uh, in Poland? It was well. It was my manager that phoned me. He said, uh, "What what's weird about it is he fo he actually phoned me. Uh, I think maybe the day before." Um, or or messaged me asking if I would make welterweight for because they were trying to find my fight cage warriors had just stopped being a promotion, yeah. and I was a bit like kind of maybe a bit down and not sure what was happening. Um, just moved back home and stuff, and they were asking me if I'd maybe be able to make welterweight, get a short fight, a quick fight, and I was like, I don't know. I was walking around at about eighty six kilos. Right. Um. And so what? And what would you need to have been at then to fight at welterweight? Yeah, uh, at welterweight seventy seven. So right. that's what I'm fighting at uh, on the twenty eighth. But uh, that never ended up uh, coming about. But I wasn't even sure if I could do that. And then, uh, hi, the, on the twenty sixth, I got a phone call from my manager saying uh, there's been a pullout. Well, he's like, could you make uh, lightweight in two weeks? Sixteen days was it? Sixteen days till the fight. Fifteen days till the weigh-in. So I had fifteen days to go from eighty-six kilogram to seventy. Sixteen kilos, which I think was thirty-three pounds. Uh, how do you even two and a half stone how do you go about that how, how do you even approach <laughs> that so I mean I remember as as he was telling me there was a, a pull out on the UFC crack off card uh, I remember like being on the phone stripping naked weighing myself at the same time weighed myself I, I was like I was just honest with him I was like I don't even think I could make that weight mm -hmm. if I'm honest but I was like what is it he kind of wasn't telling me he was like well it's for the UFC I was like, oh, and then he was like, uh, I was like, is it one fight? Is that a contract? What? He was like, it's a four fight contract you've been offered. If you take it, I said, right. Uh, I said, I don't think I'll make it, but what 
well, well, we'll just take the fight. I'll miss the weight. I'll make as close as I can. But uh, and then I've got a contract though still. So that was the plan. But yeah. that's what we went with. And I ended up making the weight. Uh, starved myself for two weeks. How how grueling is that? Like you know, how difficult is that? Oh, process? it was tough. I was probably eating. I was eating under a thousand calories, so I was probably eating about eight hundred calories a day, and I was training twice a day. I was training in the morning, strength conditioning in the morning, uh, and then I was training my MMA training at night. So I probably should have been on like three thousand, yeah, yeah. four thousand calories, but I was eating eight hundred. So I remember uh, I started losing a kilo every day for the first five days. I went for like eighty five to eighty, and then it just kind of hit a halt, slowed down. Um, I was seventy nine kilogram on the on the Monday. I had to weigh in on the Friday, right. so I had like eight nine kilo to lose. I lost about three kilo, uh, up until the Thursday. So I was six kilogram out twenty four hours, and then I done six kilogram in water, which is that's quite a lot. It's like what thirteen fourteen pounds. I fourteen pounds that is in water. That was pretty rough, yeah, but uh, most. Most uh, fighters do close to maybe ten pounds, um, and water anyway. Yeah. So it's the way in, dehydrate yourself, way in, um, and then obviously put it all back on. You're kind of forced to do it because if you didn't do it, your opponent doesn't. And you're fighting a naturally bigger guy. Yeah. Why wow, that was a. Uh, I mean, you must. A long two you, weeks. you must feel exhausted in the lead up to to going to the way in. If that's the kind of work that's that's having to go in. Well, I, I wouldn't normally do that. Yeah. Like, that was just because it was two weeks' mm. notice. Uh, but, um, I mean, they are all tough. That one was the, the worst one. Yeah. Uh, two weeks of, you know, starving myself and a big weight cut. I remember I made weight, uh, obviously quite dehydrated. Uh, and my, my voice, actually. So it, it damaged my vocal kind of yeah. uh, in my throat. I was... Uh, my my voice started going on high pitched and stuff. I got a bit panicked. I was like, oh, what's, what's going on with my throat? Severely dehydrated. Yeah. You were allowed IVs at the time. Um, so I got an IV. I found a Polish nurse to give me an IV. And uh, I, I ended up winning the fight. Second round, TKO. Okay, that was, it was um, worth it in the end. Aye, right? aye, that's it. it. Definitely What was that? It, I mean, well, I know we're kind of we're, we're, we're powering through your career here, but just in terms of that, the years that you spent as a UFC name, UFC fighter, what was it like? Because I'm assuming that involved, you know, big arenas, big nights and big events and fighting some of the biggest names in the sport as well. I mean, it was good because obviously I'd, I'd uh, trained for, what, six years, which is actually quite short compared to how long some people do. But uh, I'd been training since 2019, like full time making no money at all, uh, you know, two, three kids mm -hmm. by that point. Um, and, uh, aye, it was tough. It was tough, to, it was, you know, to, to be able to keep doing that and trying to just, you know, keep pushing to, and think, oh, it will be worth it. Um, definitely tough. But, uh, like I said, it, aye, it was all worth it. I mean, my third kid, Myla, uh, she was due April 15th. Um, is it April fifteenth? Aye, she was due April fifteenth, and uh, the fight was April eleventh. So, so I took the fight also, maybe not being able to be there because my wife never, uh, she never came. She mm -hmm. obviously stayed at home, and I, I risked maybe not seeing the birth. But uh, luckily, done the fight, got back, and uh, she was born April eighteenth. Yeah. So. But aye, it was just unbelievable, you know, we were, you know, never had a lot of money, had the our third kid on the way, you know, we were renting a house in Kirkcaldy, um, just trying to get by and then I uh, made a decent amount of money in my first fight, uh, it was on 10, t standard contract is 10 and 10 for your first fight in the UFC, which is still not that great for being at the highest of levels. Uh, argumentatively but um <laughs> I I mean I, I won so I won twenty thousand dollars and then got a wee bonus after it as well. I think when you got a stoppage and stuff you got a bonus. Um But it's it's just sort of like it's one of those things of that's a path you need to go. You're saying the family's 
your family's sort of growing around you, you're having to step up and, and try and provide for them as well, and, and that's the path you have to take. But I'm going to look here, you retired in 2020, and then you come back in 2021, you, cite with the, you, you signed with yep. the, the PFL. But PFL. Talk, talk me through that, leaving UFC, retiring in 2020, and then, and then coming back in 2021. Aye, aye. So I like I said, a tough sport to to do, and uh, you only get paid when you fight as well. So um, you know, if if you didn't fight, you didn't get paid. You can train for twelve weeks and then get injured before the fight, and then you've lost all that money you've spent on the. Uh, it's just a very tough career, and um, I I done well in the UFC. I fought uh, even before the UFC. Just quickly, uh, like even my my wife's family uh, telling me, you know, go get a normal job, give up, blah blah blah. So the pressure of even that getting told to like, mm -hmm. you know, provide, and I, I understand it. But like I said, I, I I seen a vision and I knew that I could make it. I eventually did, but um, I, I had eleven fights in the UFC, seven wins, four losses. My last fight in the UFC was actually the biggest one in my career. Um, and then there was this weird thing that was going on with the UFC. I, f I signed a new four-fight deal with the UFC. Uh, I was with my manager, uh, who's still my manager mm -hmm. now, Ali Abdelaziz, um, and he messaged me saying, like, I had a fight on a, was it UFC London 2020, I think it was, uh, or 2019. I'm sure it was 2020, COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got injured, pulled out the fight for the first time in my career. I pulled out uh, a fight because I, I had like knee knee bother, knee injuries. Um, the whole show ended up getting cancelled because of COVID, but uh, which is good because everybody got paid. Yeah. Uh, but I pulled out early, so I never got paid. But um, by my manager started saying, "Oh, the UFC are uh, they're wanting to get rid of you. They're wanting to they're wanting you to sign as a." Uh, like go as a free agent yeah. to leave your contract and I was like well I don't want to leave I yeah. want to keep fighting for the UFC and can work hard to get here and I've just signed a four fight deal and he was like oh. and then he started saying like well you've not got a choice they're right you've either got to leave or or they're going to cut you and I was like right well can't. there was a bit of back and forth where I was like I, I yeah. don't want it and I didn't know if it was even legal for them to do it yeah. I didn't know if they were even allowed because I had won my last fight, I remember them asking me to go and get um, medical clearance for my knees. So I went and got medical clearance, and I think they were shocked that, you know, the orthopedic said, look, his knee is damaged, but he can still fight. Yeah. But, uh, so that happened, and eventually I was like, well, I've not got a choice. Because he said, look, you, your two choices are you go as a free agent, and then you try and sign somewhere else, or the UFC cut you. They tell, they tell everybody why they've cut you and then the other company wants to sign you because of that. So that's what happened. Yeah. And no, 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 everybody knows that story either. But um, I, that happened. I went as a free agent. It was COVID. People weren't uh, exactly, uh, the world was funny bits. Mm -hmm. So uh, I waited and waited and then I was just, my knee was pretty bad at that time as well. And I was just, oh, I came out. I was like, I was just everything I'd done over the years and made it to the top of the game won my last fight biggest one in my career do it, new four fight contract and then that happened yeah. and I was almost like felt like life wasn't fair feeling sorry for myself and I was just like screw you um, I'm done and I emotionally retired I put over at the side of the road done a live video uh, I was like I'm done mm -hmm. done with the sport and retired and then that's when I uh, you know, there was a bit of back and forth and then the PFL opportunity came up. My manager phoned me saying, uh, PFL, you, they're wanting you to fight in their million, million dollar contract. A uh, million dollar tournament, sorry. Uh, f potentially four fights to a million dollars. And uh, aye, that's when I was like, right. That was enough well, that, well, that, that's good, it. Though. That's it. I was like, let's do it. And you defeated uh, the former world champion, Anthony Pettis, twice. 2022 so not even that long after obviously that you've signed with the pfl how big an achievement was that i've obviously seen the videos you know the uh the scottish twister and stuff Aye. like that you have to explain to us obviously what that is but but how did that feel you know to win a massive two massive fights like that against somebody of that quality um so 
Aye, so the way, the way the tournament works is it's like a point system. It's a wee bit different to, to other places, but uh, kind of like the group stages, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, of football. Um, you could lose you could lose the first fight, but still qualify. Mm. Um, so it's not just like knock out and then, yeah. you know, you're in or out. Um, so first two fights is like group stages. You get six points for a first round finish, five for a second, four for a third, or three for a decision. So I lost the first fight against Alexander Martinez, close fight. I got, uh, they gave me Anthony Pettis the second fight, which I think, you know, now seeing it, I think they gave me him thinking he was going to beat me and right. they would, because he's obviously the big name and the big draw and whatever, but I ended up uh, twistering him, Scottish twister, so uh, I took him down and there was a, a move that I was landing quite a lot, Scottish twister, um, just basically a twister, you're twisting the body, it's a a brutal submission where you're twisting somebody's spine. Uh, no for the faint hearted. No, but, uh, but the way I did it was a wee bit different than nobody had ever seen. Uh, it was from like a body triangle. Uh, I, I'd watched some footage of him seeing that he escaped the back by turning in. And I knew that if I had the body triangle and he done that, I knew I would be able to get my twister. Um, so I'd landed that a few times in training and stuff. Um, I'd finished someday where in a grappling competition as well, so that was the second time I'd I'd hit that. But like I said, it was on a big, uh, I it was on a big screen. Yeah, yeah. It was in Atlanta PFL, um, and uh, I I beat him. Uh, it went a wee bit viral, and the way the tournament worked, like I said, I'd lost the first fight. I was the very last person to fight, so right. it's like all the other. Matches had already happened. I knew exactly what I needed to win. Yeah. So I had to win within twelve minutes if I wanted to qualify. Because if it was anything before twelve minutes, mm -hmm. you know the person sitting in fourth place would qualify. Right. Okay. Yeah. If I won before twelve minutes, I would bump him out basically. <laughs> so I bumped him out. Um. And the way it worked was he was Anthony Pettis was already through. He was guaranteed in because he had six points. So even if I beat him, mm -hmm. he was still through to the finals, uh, the semi-finals, and that's uh, obviously what happened. I beat him, qualified, and the way it worked, the number one fighter fought the number four fighter, right. and number two fighter fought number three fighter. So he was number one anyway, with six points. And when I finished him and got five points, uh, I think I was sitting in fourth place. So it was a, like an immediate rematch. A rematch again. I'd already beat him, but now we're rematching in the semi-final. And uh, aye, that was in New York, Madison Square Garden. And then I uh, beat him again. I uh, beat him on points that time. And then what What happens then? The f the final? What, what's the story? Uh, so I beat him twice. Uh, he's a former UFC champion. I think he was UFC champion in 2013. Big, massive name. Um, and uh, I, I made it to the final. The final was also in Madison Square Garden. Uh, I fought a guy, Olivier. Obon Mercier, I trained with him before in Canada. I knew he was good, tough. I think he he was maybe six and zero in the PFL at the time. He had been in the UFC and stuff as well. And uh, first round, he maybe won the first round with the leg kicks. Uh, so first round was done. He maybe edged the first round. Second round, I was winning. Mm -hmm. Took him down. Got the body triangle. The, the same thing that it's probably the most dominant position in MMA you're on somebody's back you're at, you've got a very good chance of getting a rare naked choke or finishing the fight with strikes and uh, I, I made a few mistakes he managed to get up to the feet and then I just caught me with a shot yeah. right hook and uh, that was it that was it. I, that was it I got caught got knocked out second flash knockout so I was out for like maybe a second or yeah. something but that was it done see I'm I mean, not to dwell on obviously the, the, the defeat, but even go, to go back to that initial fight against Pettis that you're talking about and the Scot the Scottish Twister move. But what is interesting to me here is <coughs> there's a process in your mind as to how to even achieve that and you're looking at and thinking of what vulnerabilities is, does he have that will allow you to, to capitalise on it? But when you watch, you know, any, be it boxing, MMA, whatever, you know, it's it's a quick sport. There's a lot happening. 
is this just experience through the years that you're able to process all of those thoughts in your mind and to, to basically pick it apart like that even as the fight's going on? Aye, I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff online these days, so uh, there's loads of fights online. You you go, you study your guy, you try and see where they're weak, where they're strong. Um, and, yeah, I mean, obviously my... my uh, my opponent, he was a southpaw as well, so, um, you know, he obviously fought the uh, kicking my legs, which worked, because uh, that started bothering me uh, when he was kicking my legs. Um, and then in the second round, you know, I was worried about the leg kicks, mm -hmm. and then it, he ended up landing the punch, but it's one of the ones sometimes it doesn't matter. Uh, in boxing and MMA, you know, especially MMA, because there's so many different ways you can win. That's why, like, the best MMA fighters are never, ever, like, undefeated. Mm. You know, they've all kind of really been beat, apart from maybe one or two. But, um, aye, one punch can change it all. It doesn't matter uh, how good you are. Um, I just got caught on the night. And, uh, but aye, there's obviously a lot that goes into it. You need to, you know, there's the wrestling, there's the striking, the jiu-jitsu, and it's hard to be the best in mm. all, all areas. Because... It's obviously an incredibly tough sport. Like any sport, obviously, there's a whole lot of work that goes in to make it to the top. But obviously in this sport, there's other elements that make it tough. The fact that it's, you know, it's a combat sport, so there's a real physical element to it as well. But I want to talk to you about something that I'm sure for you, even having experienced all of those tough fights through your life, that this would have been harder than anything else. And that is, of course, that in... 2022, your daughter was diagnosed with a rare brain condition which required surgery. I mean, I can't even imagine how difficult that must have been for you, for your family, especially if you're, you know, you're still at that point in time fighting as well. Just talk to me about that whole episode and, and how you managed to, to get through it. Aye, so 2019 was when we realised that uh, Myla was epileptic. Um, so Myla was born in 2015, the, the one that I spoke about earlier. Um, she was four and a half, 2019, July 25th, uh, summer, one of the hottest days of the year. Um, in Scotland anyway, you know, it was a, it was a good day. It was very hot. Um, I'd been coaching and I got a after coaching, I actually decided to go go to the gym because I rented off a like a proper gym. Uh, so I was lifting weights, and you know I got a phone call, um, and there was somebody screaming on the phone, crying, like trying to say something to me. And I later, obviously, realised it was my wife. She had said, uh, "Oh, it's Myla, it's Myla. She's something's wrong with Myla. She's no waking up." And I'm like, "What are you on about?" And she's like, "Myla's no waking up." Uh, we're in the hospital, uh, and then I was like, "What? What's happened?" Kind of like, "What the?" Because uh, we never knew anything. And uh, she said, "I don't know, but we're in." She was in the bath, and then, uh, so I'm like, "What? You left her in the bath? Uh, like, thinking she's drowned or yeah. something?" Uh, she's like, "No, no, she was in the bath, and then she came out, and I've put her jammies on, and I've gave her a dummy and that, and then I've just I've something, something uh, made her want to go up and check, and uh, Myla had like slavers." It looked like foam, but it was like slavers at the side of her mouth. And uh, her eyes were open. It was weird. So she had been having a seizure that we later figured out. But Natalie, uh, her phone was dead. We never had a house phone either. So she ran to a friend that she had just been with down the, down the street, like two sec two minutes, and uh, got panicked. She then ran up with her, got Myla, and just took her straight to the hospital. Uh, never phoned an ambulance or mm. that, just... Because somebody next door was like, just take her straight to the hospital. Uh, so I, well, I've then uh, drove straight to the hospital uh, as safely as I could, but like a maniac a wee bit. Uh, just all oh, worried. Um, got in and she's, I'm then getting told she's uh, getting put into a coma. Um, she had had all the anti-seizure medication and uh, she's not coming out of it. So at this point, still didn't even know she's having a, had a seizure, she's epileptic, none of that. I'm just like, what the hell is going on? Mm -hmm. Finding out that my, my daughter's getting put in a coma. 
Uh, so she got put in that for 24 hours and then uh, then got brought out and stuff. But uh, aye, a few other seizures later. Um, like That was a one-off. I think three months later she had another wee one. A few months later had another one. She then got diagnosed with epilepsy. Um, so it was kind of controlled with medicine a wee bit. Like over the years she would, apart from lockdown, she started having like a lot. She was having one every hour at one point, just through the night, uh, every hour, uh, to then more, and oh, it was chaos. But uh, it then got back under control. Um, and I fast forward uh, to before the fight, I think it was be- between four and six weeks before the million dollar fight. Uh, we had an appointment for Myla, and usually, like, we had, we had appointments over the years, like turn up or oh, we'll go reduce the medicine or we'll go increase this, do that uh, to get them under control um, so Natalie's like, you've got a fight you just go to your training I'll tell you what happens, like what the update is I'm like, no worries so, uh, I remember being on the mat and uh, she phoned me and she's greeting and she's saying uh, oh, they've found someone with Myla's MRI uh, I'm like what is that? and they're like, she, well, she first said she, Myla needs brain surgery. Uh, and I was greeting, and I started greeting and stuff. Uh, and then she said she's got a cortical dysplasia type 2, which is like, to be honest, I'm no 100% clued up, but there's, there's a dysplasia that uh, that's an abnormality yeah. in our brain, basically, that needs ideally taken out. Um, so, and they basically said that, like, the they recommended surgery because the medicine is never, ever going to control it. She's a vet, she's medicine resistant, which is quite a, I think there's only, like, a certain percentage. Like, usually with epilepsy, you get medicine that controls it your whole life. Yeah. Uh, but there's a small minority of people that just will never, ever, medicine will never control it, and she's one of them. So... You need to try surgery, basically, or eventually she might die. So we're like, well, obviously, we're going yeah. to try the surgery then. Um, so I, I mean, I, I mean, bursting out greeting on the mat in front of all my teammates, and everybody was wondering what was going on. Uh, she had to get a golf ball size part of her brain cut out. Um, and on the MRI, they could see that there was something different, the cortical dysplasia. I think when they're doing the surgery, they kind of like, kind of, it just looks the same. Yeah. And so they're kind of, they're obviously clued up with doing it, but um, they're kind of get no guessing, but they're, they're guessing a wee bit how much to take because they want to take too much, they want to take too much, too little. Mm-hmm. But uh, aye, our latest, our latest uh, MRI has shown that she's still got some dysplasia because she still had seizures since the, right. the surgery. So I were basically went and I've got an appointment on the 19th of this month to find out if she's getting a second surgery. So it's like an ongoing kind of battle Because the, ho- the whole reason for the surgery was to try and stop the seizures. She'll always have epilepsy, um, but the it's to try and stop the seizures because... Um, Obviously, uh, there's loads of people that die all the time with mm. epilepsy and having seizures. Um, they can be, like, uncontrolled and anything above five minutes uh, is life-threatening. Right. Um, I can't remember the name of it now, but there's a certain name where it's over five minutes and, uh, aye, that's life-threatening. So, aye, we're, we're now back at that kind of stage where we're waiting to hear if they recommend another surgery mm. or not because... Touch wood, she's not had a, she's yeah. not had a surgery, uh, she's not had a seizure in a few months, like maybe four months. So that's the hope that just that eventually she kind of stops having them because mm-hmm. uh, it could be, uh, we're used to it now, but oh, I see when she, like just me sitting talking to you and then it's like, it's like when you're watching the TV back in the day and it's working and it just starts going crazy. Yeah. Kind of like, it's like what's happening with our brain, it's. It must be really terrifying for you, obviously, as a parent, for your wife as well, and, you know, just to know that this is like sort of ongoing. Aye. Uh, every time, every single time she had one to start with, uh, we would, like, 
panic, phone an ambulance, uh, aye, and just worry that, you know, she was going to die. Um, so I we're more used to it mm-hmm. now, we're clued up in that now, but still scary. Yeah, it's like, uh, a, a, from your point of view, it's it's another battle, you know, it's another fight that, 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 that you she, come She's through. a wee bit, I didn't notice it as much, but my, my wife does, she's... Myla is a lot different since the surgery as well because mm. they've had to take obviously a golf ball size of her brain away. Um, it's the frontal lobe, so it's to do with like behaviour and empathy and that. I think so. She's quite uh, I like says it how it is and yeah, right. hasn't got any kind of hold back if you like. Uh, but I so she, her behaviour's a wee bit and she's very behind as well. So when we went to like the psychology to speak about her. Um, they said that Myla is very similar to Lara in terms of like, um, yeah, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, uh, intelligent wise, mm-hmm. and Lara's like four, Myla's nine, uh, compared to like my other daughter Millie, that's twelve. Uh, so I she's just very behind, and I could could I'm hoping that eventually like she just stops having seizures, yeah. but it could be a thing that. You know, we're having to be like carers her whole life. Yeah. Because if that continues, I, I doubt she'll be allowed to drive, uh, you know, allowed to maybe even go in the bath or so. And yeah, yeah. you've got to worry about all that stuff. Uh, it's, a, it's a really difficult challenge for you, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I, I'm going to bring you back now to, to your sort of career as well. Because it's, you know, that like we were looking earlier at you initially being with the PFL, then you came away from that. You know, another retirement from the from the sport, but you're back now. You're headlining the main event at the at the the hydro at, at the end of September, the twenty eighth of September. You are going to be fighting up against Lewis Long. But first of all, just tell me what what made you want to get back in amongst it and back into the fighting game. Uh, so, I mean. I came back for the, because when I first initially retired, it wasn't even a real retirement, it was almost like I was annoyed. Uh, so I'd done the PFL Million Dollar Tournament and uh, that was really rough going, like that was tough. Uh, I know I spoke earlier about saying doing 12 fights, in the, but it was nowhere near compared to the level I'm training at now. Um, to fight four fights just in a year long, any, any kind of full-time pro fighter will know that's, quite grueling. I think it was like four fights within eight months. Um back to back. Uh pretty much on fight camp all year round. Um and uh I obviously missing out of the million dollars the first time. The sec I had another spot in the tournament. So uh I fought the first fight, I lost on a decision against Nathan Schult. But same as the first year, you know, I lost the first fight and then still qualified. Mm-hmm. So I was due to fight Clay Collard, which was my last fight. I think it was June 2023, uh, June last year. And I did kind of say to myself, like, as soon as I'm out of the tournament, like, this is my last year. I'll try and I'll try again. As soon as I get put out, that's me done. Because, uh, again, I was getting older. I have got injuries. The body's... You know, it's hard keeping up with the young, it's a young, young person sport. Mm. Uh, I'm 34 and a lot of my training partners are young 20s and stuff. But anyway, uh, so I never knew if it was going to be my last fight or no, because it's a tournament. Uh, if, I, if I beat him and qualified, then I'd have another fight. Uh, obviously, I lost, I got put out of the tournament, but I didn't like how, I just never knew. So I kind of said to myself, I would like to do another fight knowing it's my last fight. Right. So that's the plan for this. So this, but, this, in your mind, then this is it. I think so, but uh, it can be. I mean, I'd, I'd imagine it's like football players as well, or any kind of sports people. It's tough. It's all I've done since, well, really since I started training two thousand and nine. I had some jobs on the side and stuff, uh, construction and or sports. But I mean, really since twenty fifteen, this has been my full time job. Uh, so it's hard to like walk away mm-hmm. and just what I and there's that as well, you know. It's what do I do now? Yeah. I mean, I've got my own. I've got my like my own club that I teach at. But in terms of financially, money wise, like that's like pocket money compared yeah. to the fight money. Um, and I'm assuming as well, there's a element of this of 
the thrill and the, Aye, that as well. the adrenaline of stepping him into a, a cage and, and being in front of, you know, however many thousands of people, like, that must be difficult to, to say, right, that's me done with that and, and walk away from it. I mean, the, the, it's the highest highs and the lowest lows, you know, it's such a roller coaster. You can be feeling on top of the world to them being depressed. Like, that's how the fight game kind of works. But my coach has told me as well, my coach James Dillon, he said that that feeling never really ever goes. Like, mm. he's been retired, I think, 10 years or something, and he still, you know, misses the, the thrill. And so that'll probably always be there. But I have obviously realised, like, I'm just, I'm getting a bit slower. I'm like no recovering as much as much as some of my teammates, uh, and uh, I slowly but surely they're like overtaking mm. me in terms of like skill and just being able to keep up with them. So I've kind of agreed with myself and my wife and kind of like tried to figure out that um, this is supposed to be the last one. But if something came up. And it made sense. Um, it excited me, or or it was it either excited me because the money was good, or because of the opponent or yeah. the place. Then I would maybe fight again. But if that doesn't happen, then yeah, then this will be the last one. Because I I said to myself after the last fight, I'd like to have fought, like knowing it's the last fight. Yeah. yeah. So that's the idea of this, and it's in Scotland. Yeah. I've no fought in Scotland in like seven years been all over America and stuff so I thought you know what it'd be good to have a, a fight at home so all my fans that wanted to come and watch could could come and watch if so uh, so I. but like I said if, if someone comes up then I never know <laughs> so, but, uh, there could be there could be another but this uh, well, at my, least well, just now is I it? always say money talks Aye. you know there's money talks and if something interesting comes up and that makes sense to do it then, then I'll do it but I mean my, bo- my body's breaking so <laughs> Uh, aye. If if there's someone else out there, that, yeah. then I'll I'll do that instead. But on this event, much how much are you looking forward to this? You know, the hydro, it's a cracking big arena. It will be jam packed. You know, you're saying it's been seven years since you fought in Scotland. So how much are you looking forward to to this on September the twenty eighth? Aye, I'm looking forward to. I mean, it's it's a mix of emotions. Um, one because I know it's the last one. Two, like. I'm at that grueling part of fight camp where I'm part of me just always kind of wait until it's over. Mm. Like I just can't wait to eat a pizza <laughs> and uh, or you know get a cider or yeah. whatever. But uh, um, I fought in the hydro twice. First time in 2015, I knocked out Leonardo Mafra. That was for the UFC. My second fight in the UFC. I got knocked out of the night as well, so I got an extra fifty thousand dollars. Um. Aye, that was like probably the highlight, one of the highlights of my career. Uh, probably like atmosphere wise, that was a highlight of my yeah. career because there was 13,000 Scottish fans. I just won in the first round by knockout. Uh, fans going crazy. They were all chanting my name before the fight Stevie, 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 F and Ray. <laughs> uh, like everybody chanting it. And then, like I said, I got the win. Got told at the press conference that an extra 50 G's in the bank. Uh, oh, it was just an amazing night. And then I fought again in 2017. That didn't go so well. I got <laughs> knocked out. I was on the other receiving end. And that's what I mean. Highest highs and lowest lows. So I've... I've... Uh, I have won in the hydro and I've lost in the hydro. Mm-hmm. Won by knockout, lost by knockout. So... And I, I've kind of... I've been around the sport quite a long time. I've seen it all. Um, so I'm trying to just put not a lot of pressure on this, like just try and enjoy it because there's a lot of fights I go in and like I said, I just can't wait till it's over. Just yeah. can't wait until it's, oh, just get my life back. So this one I'm trying to just, just enjoy, enjoy it. It's the last one. Um, I just go out and have fun. Yeah, and it's set to be an absolute cracker as well. So that's on the 28th of September at the, at the high row. You're fighting up against Lewis Long, so obviously hope we hope that goes that goes well for you and enjoy it. Um, before we finish up, obviously we're here at this wonderful uh, arena, this wonderful stadium here, Celtic Park. You're a Celtic supporter yourself. Um, so before we finish up, obviously it's only right that we get a wee bit of a, a chat about Celtic. Looking back, you know, we talk about growing up, 
you got vivid memories in terms of getting involved in mixed martial arts, but when you're growing up, what's your earliest sort of Celtic memory? Uh, earliest memory? I don't know if it's because I get punched in the head for a living <laughs> or what, but I, I, I can't remember too young, but I remember like eight-year-old, that's when I was, you know, between eight and probably 12 was when I was like diehard Celtic. Uh, you know, it was when, uh, you know, Henrik Larson, my favourite player, uh, there was Chris Sutton, um, uh, John Hartson, Bobo yeah. Balde, that team, uh, that was a kind of highlight of my kind of football career. Um, aye. Uh, so looking back, I mean, that's a, what a, a great Celtic side, obviously. You're talking about Henrik Larson there. I mean, Hartson, Sutton, Larson, incredible trio of players. Yep. If you were to pick one, though, I, I mean, I, I'm going to assume you might pick Henrik Larsson here just because of how wonderful he was, but you know, who was your Celtic hero then growing up? Aye, so I was Hen Henrik Larsson, yeah. aye. He was my favourite player. Uh, aye, I mean, he's, I, I'd imagine someday at my age, it's probably, uh, you know, everybody's kind of favourite player. He yeah. was, he was uh, a legend. Yeah, he's unbelievable. And, and still is. Were you... Were you Kicking a ball about outside or in the playground at that age as well, or aye. So I I used to play football. Uh, I played uh, kind of my whole life until I started uh, until I was about seventeen, maybe kind of, and then I just stopped. Uh, aye, kind of when I started fighting um, in twenty nineteen, I just kind of started watching because I never mm. watched fighting before I started I never watched the MMA or UFC mm. or nothing um, and uh, yeah when I started training I just started then kind of watching that and stopped watching football as much stopped playing and that but yeah before that I played like uh, for a Sunday league and um, aye it was kind of my main main thing to do. What position did you play? Uh, so I, I preferred to play up front but it was one of the ones that would have me all over the place so I they would have me in defence because I was quite like rough and <laughs> uh, strong. Uh, but and then when I was younger, I was quite fast, so I'd been I kind of played all over. Mm. I preferred to play up front, but uh, I midfield up the wing. Um, a utility man, you were everywhere. <laughs> aye, aye. I liked being the the glory hunter aye. guy, so I liked being the goal scorer. Well, listen, Steve, I really appreciate you um, coming in and spending a bit of time with today, having a wee chat ahead of your massive fight that's coming up at the end of September at the Hydro. It's been really interesting obviously to hear some stories of your career and um and wish you all the best for, for, for your upcoming fight. Cheers man. Thank and you. thank you very much for watching and or listening to this episode of the official Celtic FC podcast. Make sure you like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you very much and hail hail.